just me and the world's best tasting vodka. Hey guys, welcome to again Off the Dribble with your boy Byron Scott. My guest today is my boy, this is my golf buddy. He's one of these brothers that you can call at any time and he's there for you. And I got to tell you a little bit about a few years ago where he really was there for me. Such a lonely really life hurting. I lived though. <laughs> You know, when somebody my can boy, be there, George Lopez, that's when, all I want to say. When my boy somebody's George there Lopez. 100% of the time, they got shit else to do <laughs> except wait for the bat signal in the sky. <laughs> well, George, go. before we get into your career and everything that you've done, th- there, was a, there was a very, very tough time for both of us a few years ago. Yeah, man. Uh, when when our, our buddy, you know, Kobe Bryant passed away. And this man, I, I took like two weeks where so I wouldn't talk to nobody. And George sent me a text and said, B, I know you're hurting, but let's go play some golf or something. And I remember getting back to George. I said, George, give me another week or so. Because right. I, was, I, was I was just in pain. A couple of weeks went by. I called George. I said, man, I, I'm ready. Let's get out and play golf. It was, it was about was a seven-hour round because we let everybody go through. We made stops. We had drinks. We <laughs> yeah. celebrated Kobe Bryant's life and his achievements. And I don't think I ever got a chance to say thank you, George, because, I mean, I really appreciated that, mm-hmm. man, and it, it was awesome of you to give me that call. Well, thank you for for being there for me, too, because that, I mean, it's, it, you know, my, oh, man, my daughter called me and said, oh, I just, like, what what happened? Yeah. You know, yeah. and, and it, it, it's, I mean, you know, Places stay forever, you know, monuments and and things in Europe you can see around the world, but that guy to us in LA and to just was a monument. I think that that he he will be remembered, you know <clears throat> I mean everybody's remembered forever, but remembered every day. Yeah. Yeah. And that's when somebody's really important when you yeah. remember them every day. Yeah. And um, you know I you know, the the, the happy thing about all of that is that, you know, he had a, an amazing impact on a lot of people, and and he did it off the course with off the the court with like humor, man. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. and he was a he was a funny guy, and he was a sweet guy, you know that. And yeah. he was a guy that, you know, the mamba mentality is a great, you know, just a great two words to go together. You know, it's, it's like somebody's will, mm-hmm. but to see somebody that that did what he did and walked it and talked it. And I went to a lot of Friday night games Mm -hmm. and they always come down to the last shot and he made a lot of them, but the ones that he missed, nobody went, oh, it just, he missed it. And everybody was like, okay, we didn't win. But he made more (laughs) than he missed. But when he missed one, nobody was disappointed. And that's that says a lot about somebody's ability. Yeah, you was almost shocked when he missed one. You know what I'm saying? Because he was so... He was so great at making them, and he would make them if it was one on one, two on two, two on one. He didn't care if they brought a double team. He was that type of guy where he was he was willing to be the, the hero, just like he was willing to be the goat. Absolutely, and, and that's that mama mentality that we talk about. But before we get going to get a little bit more, gotta say thank you again, George, Absolutely. for coming out, my brother. Cheers, man. We're gonna have a good time. A little Neff vodka in here, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> Wow, that's good. Ain't that good? Yeah, that's really good. So, George, let, let's start off this way. Let, I mean, I want to talk to you because you've done so much. You, you've accomplished so many things <clears throat> in the entertainment world. I mean, you one of you one of my funniest friends I've ever been around. Thank Spe- you. I love playing golf with this man because we have eighteen holes of yeah. laughter. Yeah, and we might good. get some bad shots, but we're gonna have eighteen holes of you're, laughter. You know, listen, fun. man. You're, you're. I mean, I. You're a professional athlete. I played golf because of my temperament and you know golf i didn't want to get remarried so i didn't want somebody telling me all my (laughs) faults so i'll let golf decide what's wrong with me so you know um if you cheat you're cheating yourself if you quit you're a quitter if you write the wrong score down if you're not gracious to people if you don't say hello and which all the things in life that are easy to do right you know uh uh so it it was a way for me to see what people had said about me, uh, criticisms about me, even when I was younger, and for me to realize when there was nobody else around and nobody to blame, 
that those were the real issues that I had mm. about writing down the wrong score, integrity, cheating, moving the ball, <laughs> and all of those things of uh, are someone's real life. It right, brings it right. it brings it out. So, you know, it changed my life. And then, you know, I used to get really mad and throw a club or something, you know. I'm no Reggie Bush, but <laughs> That dude, Reggie be throwing them all oh, over the place, don't he? Listen, man, I played at Cedric's <laughs> golf tournament and clubs were flying all over the place. And then Cedric called my house and said, hey, uh, have you seen uh, a club in your bag? Reggie's missing a club. I said, have you checked in the trees and in the bushes? <laughs> I mean, if you throw a club, man, if you throw a club, that says a lot about your, when you want to throw one and you don't, that now you're starting you to well. internalize your things and to be better. There you and, go. And that's that's what golf has done for me. Like, I, I play pretty good. I play all those pro-ams. I mean, I can play good. I putt good. Right, short right, game's right. good. But I play for the temperament and the peace. Why does somebody go to the beach and watch a sunset? Because they go for the peace. Yeah, yeah. And, and there's a tra tranquility in that. And for me, there's tranquility in golfing. And, you know, being a member at that club and knowing that, most of the other Latinos that are there are like the service staff and all those guys. <laughs> that means a lot to me too. Yeah, no, I mean, it, and first of all, it's a, it's a great track, great club. Yeah, and uh, I appreciate you know the invites when we get a chance to play. You but know you that. remember, you know, we, we've known each other a long, long yes, time, we have. And, and yes, we have. You know, the Lakers have meant so much to me in my life, and uh, and you as a player in the '80s uh, was was a time when I spent a lot of time alone. You know, and and. Uh, my grandparents were still alive, you know, and I was such a fan, but I was always alone that in those Boston Celtics or in those championships <laughs> and those finals, when it got down to the crunch time, I would go outside. Like a expectant father would leave the room. I can't take it anymore. <laughs> outside smoking a cigarette. I couldn't take it. Really? I'm not playing. So but, you, when you would go outside, you would go out to get away from watching the game yes. because it was coming down to the nitty gritty and you couldn't, I couldn't, couldn't stand to see what was going to happen. I couldn't watch. Wow. I would go outside in the backyard and I'd walk around and then I would come back in and they would say they won. Oh, they won, all right. I said, oh, they <laughs> lost. The, the pass that magic threw across the court, I, oh. I was outside. Yeah, I was outside when it don't, happened. Don't, don't, don't remind me. But I was, <laughs> you know, I would say to myself, like, you know, what's gonna happen? I didn't know until later is that what's going to happen is going to happen yeah. whether I was watching or not. Right. But at that at that point, you know, and it's a lot to do with Mexicans. You ever see Mexicans go to the church? The ones that are sitting in the back still wanted to count, <laughs> but they don't want the the Lord that close. Like They're like, listen, man, I do a lot of things in my life that aren't... That, I do a lot that, of shit, that, so I don't want to sit too close. Don't right? go in this place, but I'm going to still go. But I'm going to sit way in the back. <laughs> You know, where the place, they even don't even go with the money. They're like, oh, I probably don't got no money sitting back there. So you, I just go on the back. You still get credit for going, but you, you're not as close to, to the gospel as, as somebody would feel comfortable enough. <laughs> well, you stupid. <laughs> you know. So listen. So I cussed I, in church one time. And every, did you really? You know, oh, did, man. Did, like more than one person heard you? Yes. I mean, it was, oh, okay. So a, lot, a few and, people heard and you. And you know those movies where they go, whew, all the heads yeah, right, turn right. and it makes a sound. And every head, whew, and then I said, what? <laughs> and I said, man, you cussed in church. No, and, uh, so you almost did it again. I almost did, man. I was like, I can't believe I cussed in church. And then my grandma, <laughs> that was it for me. My grandma said, hey, come over here and tell when you cussed in church. That's a long time ago. <laughs> but yeah, nobody should cuss in church. No, I agree with you there. I agree with you there. So how did you get started in the comedy? Where did I mean? I mean, was you like doing shows at the house for the family? How did no. you get started in comedy? Um, man, that's a that's a that's a good question. Let, let's see. Um, I think at, I think at first you have to be ignored. So my biological family was not a close family, mm -hmm. and they ignored me a lot. You know, my mom was not married, and my dad took off, and. I was insignificant from even when I, even before I was born. <laughs> so much less, you know, like, and my mom was not well health wise. She had epilepsy oh, and okay. she had, uh, you know, a couple of things that made people believe that before I was born, that I was going to be, and listen, I've, I've never said this word before, never told a story before, 
They thought I was going to be an imbecile. Mm. That's what they said. Mm. An imbecile. So they wouldn't like hold me and they wouldn't like, you know, kind of look after me because mm. they thought that I was going to get what she had. Mm. And uh, the word imbecile is pretty, pretty harsh, man. And as a mm. kid, you know, like, you know, my grandmother would sit, you know, my, they would say to my grandmother or more when my mom was around when I was young, they would say, don't tell him that. And my grandmother would say, well, how is he going to find out <laughs> if I don't tell? I mean, the things that were, the things that were said in anger, <laughs> listen, nobody bullshits in anger. <laughs> right. So right, the, when, right. they, when somebody's angry and they're yelling at you, they're yelling at you. The, it's the coming real, from the heart. Every, yeah. Everything. It's coming from the listen, heart. Listen, when somebody's shooting you with a gun, all those bullets have intention. When somebody's <laughs> saying, listen, I don't know where the, that guy is. I don't know who your father is. And you ever thought you're going to be an imbecile? over there want to hold you, and, you know, and your mom, is, it takes off and they can't find her wow. for weeks. And you're just like a six-year-old kid, man. You're like, that, you know, I'm six, but I don't think I need to hear all this. <laughs> so we went to court when I was seven. To have my father declared legally dead. Really? So my mom was not the smartest woman. So my grandmother said, now here's another one I never told anybody. My grandmother said, Mira Frida, look at me and I'll tell you what to answer. <laughs> so in, she in goes, court. In court. Okay. In, LA, in LA, the municipal oh, wow. court. Wow. Mira, look at me and I'll tell you what to answer. <laughs> and she gets up there. And she puts her hand up and she gets into the thing and they say, you know, are, is, are today, are you seeking the sole custody of, of George Lopez? And my, grandpa, and my mom looks and my grandmother says, and she goes, no. <laughs> I thought she was supposed and, to answer. And she said, and she goes, no. And then she's like, Frida! And she looks and she goes, she goes, she goes, Yes. Was it no or yes? Now it's a now oh, it's a shit. now oh, shit, now you yeah. have is it no or yes? And then now somebody who's not that smart has to pick between no and yes, like with no help. So she said yes, but for a minute there they would it was like what the fuck's going on, man? Like, and she. She had to answer the other questions on her own without, because you know they knew my grandmother was helping her. Right, right. So that was, listen, man, that was that that was rough. Wow, wow. That was sorry about your ears, dude. <laughs> but but uh uh yeah, so it's like that. So that's how you if that's how you start, like, you know, in the humor, I think that I had good guys that I went to school with, and they all lived kind of in that three block radius of guys that are still my friends. But mm -hmm, mm -hmm. when I was, uh, you know, I started playing baseball. I wasn't even seven yet. And my grandma uh, signed me up for baseball. And uh, then you go to the tryouts, you know, and I was already playing baseball as like a little kid, I guess. And then they went to this recreational center in San Fernando. They were picking teams. I was the last guy picked. <laughs> and then the guy says, but last but not least. And then they picked me and I was on a team one up. Like I was for my age, I should have been on the lower. Right, I was right. one up. Got you. So, when I was going to practice with that team, the White Sox, they wanted me to be a catcher, and I wasn't even seven, and I was giving the coach a hard time about me being a catcher. And I was already complaining, and I was already saying, I don't want to be a catcher. And he sent me down to the farm, and that team never lost a game, and they won the championship. And in my whole career playing baseball, I never won a championship. Mm. And I, for me, I thought it was because of me being an asshole at seven and getting sent down that I was punished for not being a fair <laughs> sport or being or understanding that sometimes everybody has to play a part on a yeah, team. You play a role. Yeah. And the coach told me that. It's like, yeah, listen, man, everybody's, everybody has a, a, a position to play and yours is catcher. And I just bitched so much that he sent me down. And wow. and then I went down to the Bears and uh, Alex Garcia, that, that boxer, that boxed probably 20 years ago, he was on my team. And uh, I remember tagging a guy out at second base, and I was catching. So imagine the catcher running across from home plate to second to base. Second base. Yeah. And that's how bad that team was that I had to go as the catcher <laughs> and tag a guy out. You couldn't throw it to the guy at second base He wouldn't tag. have caught it. So I ran across <laughs> the field to tag him out at second base in full catcher's, in full catcher's <laughs> gear. 
So I should have stayed a catcher because I was pretty good. At legend, uh, you know. But then, you know, my grandparents and I, you went to a lot of Dodger games and and the guys that uh, that I grew up with were funny. And I was funny around them, but I was shy. I think if you're going to be a good comedian or good at anything, you have to have a lot of things wrong with you in the beginning. Well, so being, right? being shy of- being shy and around other people, but, are, but being funny around my friends was at least an opening to, to something for the future. But... Finding comedy, I think, through The Tonight Show and through sitcoms, watching Sanford and Son and mm, watching mm. Chico and the Man and, and uh, you know, Cheech and Chong albums, Richard Pryor albums, mm-hmm. and George Carlin and uh, all those things. And then, you know, when I was in junior high, uh, my friend Ernie went to another school and he said, hey, there's a guy at uh, Kennedy High School and he's going to the comedy store on Monday nights and he's doing stand-up. And I'm like, he goes, we ought to go down there. So in 79, June 4th of 1979, I was still in high school, I was getting ready to graduate. And uh, I went over there and performed for the first time. Wow. So how was that? I mean, because you're still in high school. Because I was going to ask you, where'd you get your start? You know, but this seems like a little bit of a start because you're going to do stand up for the first time out of high school. And then from there, for, I want to tell, I want you to tell me the experience of doing that. How was that first? And then from there, when did you get your first job as a comedian? Um, first job, you know. You know, at the Ice House in Pasadena, you you could do if you brought people, you could make like a dollar a person. You know, <laughs> so oh, so I, so as many people as in the I audience, made like as seven dollars. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, and in 1987, before my grandfather died, I was on TV just for maybe 40 seconds, one joke in this kind of like laughing kind of reboot, mm-hmm. and my grandfather saw me. And uh, my grandfather really never had anything good to say about me. But one time uh, I was on a Sunday, they had went to eat with some friends. And when they came back, I had a picture there from the ice house. And then the guy said, who's this? And he goes, oh, my grandfather said, oh, that's my grandson. He's trying to be a comedian. And the guy said, is he funny? And he says, uh, no, but you know, he's just starting. <laughs> what, what, so what great support. Right? I, thought that was a, I thought that was the beginning, what could have been the beginning of a compliment. <laughs> right. So even through those uh, track home walls, I could hear but he never said anything, anything really good to me. So I think, you know, as sad as it is and as debilitating and as much as it hurts, you know, if you stay down, then you you stay down. Mm-hmm. And and whatever it was in me, man, that made me get up, uh, I knew I didn't want to stay down. Yeah. And not that those guys were, that I grew up with were nobodies. Right, right. Uh, I just said to somebody, I wanted to be somebody more than I wanted to be nobody. And, you know, I never expected much of a career because, I mean, you know, I always say, when you look like Mario Lopez, you can make it. But when you look like me, you got to be talented. <laughs> so, uh, so, so, so for that, I just, at some point, I mean, I quit. One time I was at this place called The Natural Fudge in, in Hollywood. Mm-hmm. And <clears throat> they made you buy like a sandwich in there. So it's a natural food store. So they bring me like a sandwich with sprouts and avocado. And this is like in the early 80s, 80, 81. And they did comedy on a Monday night. And I bombed so bad. Imagine waiting three hours and then bombing. It's like, <laughs> and you couldn't let me bomb at 8.15. You had to let me bomb after waiting three hours. And when I was driving home, um, right at the 170 and Roscoe on the way north to where, my, where I live with my grandmother. I started crying in the car. Hmm. And I said, I'm done. Like, I can't do this. I'm not good at it. It hurts. Uh, I'm just, I've had it. And then uh, I went home and I took a shower. My grandma says, why are you taking a shower so late? And I was just, I'm taking a shower. And uh, I took a shower because I wanted to wash off whatever had gotten on me from that <laughs> experience of just eating it big yeah, time i understand that. And i took a shower yeah. and then in the morning when i got up i said i wasn't gonna quit and i was gonna and i was gonna keep going yeah so i want to uh, ask you this though joyce because you i mean every time we play golf like i said we have a, a unbelievable time of laughing you know we laugh the whole yeah. time tell let them me, call you back turn, i know man <laughs> let me turn this off sorry that's all right we have an unbelievable time of just yeah laughter right and you tell some of the unbelievable stories, some of the greatest stories about your grandmother. Right. So kind of tell me, I mean, obviously she means the world to you, but just tell me how she has helped you from your childhood 
to this particular point because I, I love the stories on the golf course when you start talking about her. Man, uh, God, man, there's so many. Uh, you know, when the, when my first show started, you know, Time Magazine wrote a, a thing on me, you know, the one page in like the showbiz part of the of the back of time. And it said that <clears throat> that I should consider my grandmother my muse because of me using her in the show and using her in the stand-up to, to, to make a living for myself. So the guy goes, I don't know if he's aware <laughs> that, you know, this woman is, is the muse that he has. But she, you know, she had a hard life. She had dementia and she was at the hospital. So they told me, that, yeah, your grandma's in the hospital. So I go to Holy Cross in Mission Hills and she has dementia. And she's in this little room and I walk in and she had a way of looking at me that was like just a, a threatening way. <laughs> so she's laying in the bed and she, I walk in and I'm standing right there and she's looking at me like this. And I'm like, to myself, I'm like, is my grandma throwing me hard looks? <laughs> so I look at her, I'm like this. So she's looking at me and I'm looking at her like that. And my grandmother goes like that too. <laughs> I mean, come on, man. Come on. Now, how old was she at this time? 85. <laughs> Wanted to make she sure you didn't clinch, huh? Oh my God! What the, I mean, come on, man. A, a lady with dementia like that. But my grandmother was. She, you know, they wore abuse like you know, like if it was a a, a banner, you know, like I was with this guy nineteen years and he beat me and I, you know, I, I you know, stayed for my kids and I said, why do you stay for your kids? Why don't you go to a hotel? And she goes, you don't, you don't know nothing. I didn't, even, I didn't have any money. I said, hotels were like a dime back then. Shut <laughs> up. You know, so so she didn't want any 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 kind of opinion about her life. You know, so um, uh, my, grand, my grandfather on Fridays, he'd get off early sometimes. You know, they'd finish early, you know, and he wouldn't get out of the truck right away. And my grandma would look through the window. <laughs> He's scared to go in the house. <laughs> They're drinking in the car for hours. Go tell them to to come in. I walk out there. I go. Hey, Grandma wants you to come inside. That they like it out to, to wait. <laughs> All right. So I say he told me to tell you to wait. So what did he say? <laughs> so she started to make chile like you know that was her retaliation. So they had that mocajete, that thing, and the, the stone grinder. <laughs> and she would, because he would eat when he was drunk before he went to bed. So she said, you know, if I make this chile really hot, it's my way of getting back to him. I can't poison him. I can't <laughs> go out. And, and it's no, no wonder that she didn't go out there and say, get your ass inside. Right, right. So she would be grinding this chili. And I would come from baseball practice, and I would come through the cul-de-sac there, and I would see the truck there, and I would say, I'd see him inside, like at 830 and I would say, uh oh, so I already knew. So I'd open the gate and I would take three steps, maybe 20 feet from the house and that chili would be in the air. <laughs> and before I would walk into the house, I would go, <coughs> <coughs> it was just in the air because when it's so hot, you can't right, stand right. around it. And my grandmother would be inside and I'd go, <coughs> <coughs> and she would say, he doesn't want to come inside me now. And she's just like grinding this thing, man. So her retaliation was, was Chile for him, and she just never pulled any punches, man. <laughs> and you know, the first day of my show, like you grow up and you, you want to be a comedian, and she knows. And it's a long shoot because the first show is always long, you know. And then I look over there, and she's kind of looking off outside. We're going down the five freeway, and she's kind of wandering off, like looking off. And I'm like, at least say something to me. Like, you know, I, I got this show. Right, right. So I said, uh, Literally, man, you got to believe me. I said, what do you think, Grandpa? And she goes, you want to know? And I said, yeah, I want to know. And she says, if I would have known it was going to take this long, I would have stayed home. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, come yeah, on, man. Your, your whole defense, life, man. Right? <laughs> man. I don't know if I would take this long, I would have stayed home. And, you know, the, mo the my mom character was based off my grandmother. I was about to ask. And my grandmother watches the show and she goes, hmm. And I said, what do you think? She goes, hey, you made me nice. That's what she said. 
Everybody said because I was going to ask you that the George Lopez show. Yeah, yo, which I, I, I almost twenty I, years now. Yeah, I loved that show. I mean, I used to watch that show, and I was like, all right, I'm wondering because we knew each other. And yeah, I'm like I'm wondering is this, ba-? but we didn't talk about our upbringing and no, things no. of that nature. So I was wondering if that show was based on your upbringing, uh, a little bit of the family. Um, totally. You know, that, that was kind of intertwined into that whole thing. But it was also one of the first, if I'm not mistaken, one of the first Mexican sitcoms on a major network at the time. You know, there's a couple of things, you know. I was selling out a bunch of shows at the amphitheater. Like, I think I sold out 22 in a row. Mm. And uh, they came and uh, wrote an article in the Daily News about me. And... I had never thought about what this guy wrote. This guy said that, you know, George Lopez pays homage to the people that inspired him, you know, Freddie Prinze and Richard Pryor, but Richard Pryor or Freddie Prinze never sold those amount of tickets to have people come and see him. Mm. But he still does. But I still pay homage to those guys. Right, like Richard right. Pryor toured, but he, he you know, it's back then. So in right. comparison, it's... but. It's like I still pay respect to the people that came before me when I've, to that writer, had passed them. Mm. But I would never consider myself better than those guys. But um, uh, in, in, in those shows, uh, what was I going to say? Uh, so that was one example. And then in the history of television, you know, I Love Lucy, Desi Arnaz was the husband, but not in the title. Chico and the Man with Freddie Prinze mm-hmm. was a co-star, not in the title. I'm the only person in the history of television who's Latino who's led a show, and it's named after him. Mm-hmm. So it's higher than 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 those than those guys. But I still, you know, think of it as, you know, it's like not a, not as important. But you know, Freddie Prinze, uh, when the hundredth episode of my show was coming. Johnny Grant, who used to be the mayor of Hollywood, he said, you know, I was at another star ceremony. He said, I think it's time we put you in the Walk of Fame. And I said, I'm not going in until Freddie Prince, Freddie Prince goes in. Wow. And he looks at his assistant and he says, Freddie Prince is in, isn't it? She says, I don't know. I said, no, he's not. We'll check and we'll get back to you. So they got back to me and they said, he's not in, but if you want to nominate him, we can put him in. And I said, yeah, I want to put him in. And um, I paid the money for the star. I think it was $10,000. And then... The day of the ceremony, you know, Kathy, Freddie Prince Jr., the people, Dusty Snyder, who was with him in the room when he committed suicide, and all the friends that Freddie had, even some from New York, mm. were all there. Della Reese was there, and all these great people, man. And then Freddie Jr., I see him over there on the phone, and he walks up to me, he goes, hey, my grandma wants to talk to you, which is Freddie's mom. Mm-hmm. And she was in Puerto Rico. And I said, hello? And she goes, oh, George, you know, Thank you so much for being so loving to my Freddie. She said, my Freddie. Mm. Thank you for being a fan of my Freddie and for being loving to my Freddie. And then she said, if my Freddie was alive, you and my Freddie would be best friends. And I was like, oh, my God, man. This is, like, uh, tough. So we did the ceremony, man, and Junior was very emotional, you know, and at the unveiling of the of the uh, star, but for a dude that had zero integrity, (laughs) zero credibility, zero ability to tell the truth, and zero care for anybody else but myself, I grew up to have eliminated all of those things from my life. I'm not who I was when I was 25. I'm not who I was when I was 15. And uh, at 60, I'm, I'm 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 a person that I never would have imagined I would be. Man, you know what? I think we both there. Because I, I never would imagine me being who I am right <laughs> Thank now. You, you know man. what I mean, George? Cheers to that. So listen, guys, we're going to take a quick little break. We'll be right back with a little bit more of my boy, George Lopez. And we'll talk a little bit more again about his career and where he is today. And what's up next for him? We'll be right back. Black Widow is a conglomerate of attorneys and investigators that are community-based. They started from a personal traumatic loss that turned into a platform for human dignity and rights. Black Widow always finds ways to eradicate the wrongs and produce positive results beyond all boundaries, and they always pay it forward. Black Widow can handle any and all legal matters, including motorcycle injuries, car accidents, trips and falls, 
criminal matters, family law, workers' compensation, and restraining orders, and more. In all industries where money rules and basics give rights are overcome by greed, we strive to make it about humanity by repeatedly educating and informing the masses of their rights. If you have ever felt frustrated or anger that you have been done wrong, that's the fire that fuels Black Widow. When you are done listening to all the rest, call Black Widow for the blunt truth. Call 818-599-3613. Again, that's 818-599-3613. Or you can find us on Instagram at Black Widow underscore investigation. Right. Welcome back to uh, Off the Dribble. Your boy B. Scott is here. And again, I'm with my boy George Lopez. We've been having a great time just pretty good talking about the old days, the old talking days. about golf, talking about all the things that we love. I want to get to now the George Lopez show. Yeah. And how that came upon you. Man. And then, man, I mean, that thing, you know, took off as well and lasted for a long time. And then I want to also know why did you kind of stop? Okay. I know you wanted to go in different directions. I know how you are. You're yeah. artistic. You want to do other things. But let's talk about the George Lopez show. First of all, you know, I never, first of all, I never thought that I would have my own show. Mm-hmm. And then you grow up watching Johnny Carson. Mm-hmm. And I was in Las Vegas, I think, 1989, in the summer of 89 or 90. Johnny Carson was going to retire. Mm. And, you know, I love Willy Wonka, like, growing up, you mm-hmm. know. So, so <laughs> in the USA Today, in the life section... There's a comedian on the cover story, this guy, Ron Schock, I think he passed away. And in the article, it says that before Johnny leaves, they're going to have six new comedians on. Mm. So I'm in Vegas in a in the Maxim Nowhere Going show. And I remember reading that, and I remember thinking, man, it's like Willy Wonka, man. Like, there's six golden tickets out there. Mm-hmm. Like, who's going to get them? Mm-hmm. Never thinking I would get one. So um, I was at the Improv one night and uh the ma- the talent booker for the tonight show sees me and says hey uh put some stuff together man and call me in a week and i was like wow it's not gonna happen man so i put some stuff together i worked all week i'd fall asleep on the notes and get up and then do them again and fall asleep and get up worked on a week so he, he says come to my come to my office so i go to his office and he goes are you ready and i'm i'm like Am I ready? And he goes, yeah. He's sitting behind the desk. He goes, show me your stuff. I was like, <laughs> that's on the spot. And I, I did it, you know, with no laughter. The guy didn't laugh. I'm talking, the guy's looking at me. Say another one is looking at me. He's like, huh, 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 huh. When I was done, he goes, congratulations, you. You got the Tonight Show. Are you serious? Yeah. He didn't. He just made sounds. He goes, "You didn't. You didn't laugh." He goes, "Hey, if I make a sound, that's like a laugh." Because <laughs> I've had people up here complete silence, and um, and Bill Cosby bumped me in '91, and then I thought it was going to go away because there was stories about guys getting bumped and then never getting called back. So mm-hmm. I got bumped, and then the next day they called, and I was on the next week. So in a in a sense, that was kind of like a beginning. But for the George Lopez show, I was drinking a lot from 95 to 99. I was on the road a lot, and I was going nowhere, and I was drinking a lot. I think my wife had kicked me out of of the house. I was living in this apartment that we hadn't sold yet, some condo, sleeping on an air mattress. Mm. And then mine was probably like four and then the crib, I didn't dismantle the crib when we left because it was still there. Mm-hmm. So I had to see the empty room with a crib in there. Mm. And I'm sleeping on the, um, I remember I bought a toaster. And I'm like, can I, can I afford to buy a toaster? <laughs> and uh, I just was like, man, this is like nowhere. You know, I'm going, I'm, I'm nowhere. And uh, I used to worry about what everybody else was doing. Mm. And then in that, in that condo, they were empty. I started thinking, you know what, man? I'm going to worry less about what everybody's doing. I'm just going to worry about myself yep, because yep. I'm worried about everybody else and look where I am. Mm-hmm. I'm living in this thing. And people would see me and they go, I thought you moved. You know, I was like, oh, no, you know, we're doing some work up here, renovations. <laughs> then I fill up the mattress every night. Uh, but when I, when I did that, things started to, you could feel a change. But also, I was at the 
Capital City Comedy Club, and Chappelle had been there the week before, and Sandra Bullock had come to see Chappelle. Sandra Bullock had a house in Austin, Texas. And then the manager comes to me after the first show and goes, hey, man, I got a call. I think Sandra Bullock's coming to the show. And I knew that I was not in condition or even professional enough as a comedian. I was drinking on stage that it wouldn't have been entertaining. And the second shows are always like, you know, half full, first one full. So I literally be got on my knees in the dressing room and begged God to keep her from coming to the show. I got on my knees and I went like this. And I said, if you're up there, please don't let her come and see me. <laughs> wow. And then the guy knocks while the first second show started. He goes, and I open the door. He goes, she's not coming, man. She called and she, she's not going to come after all. Wow. So cut to like two years later, I get a call and they said, hey, man, there's producers looking for a Latino, you know, comedian and something. So everybody said, have you seen George Lopez? So this guy came to see me and he was working for Sandra, but I didn't know at the time. And then he saw me and he went away. And then uh, I remember Ann said, did you talk to the guy? And I said, no, he left. A full calendar year later, the guy calls and he said, hey, are you still interested in this project that we have? And I'm like, what project? And we found out it was, uh, it was Sandra. So I went to Sandra's office during the day, I wasn't going to go. I was hitting golf balls at Witsit. Mm -hmm. And I was supposed to be there at 1. I think my manager knew that I might flake out. So about 12, 15, he calls me. He goes, are you on your way? And I said, man, I'm not going over there, man. He goes, what do you mean? I said, what's she going to do for me? What's Santa Bull going to do for me? And he goes, hey, listen, man. They called and they said, is he coming? They ordered food. With him, it was always food. They ordered food. <laughs> you know, you better go over there, man. You're not going to leave her hanging. So I left the balls there at a big bucket. Left them there, told the guy, hey, man, you can have these if you want. And I drove over there. And we sat for like three hours. You know, she said, tell me about your life. And, you know, she was crying. She was laughing until my grandmother and everything, you know. And uh, we were, she was writing it all down. Had a writer's assistant. And as we're walking down the stairs, she walked me out. Mm -hmm. And we got to the, she opened the door for me. And before I left, I looked at her and I said, hey, I don't know how this is going to end up. I don't know if I ever see you again. Or I don't know anything. I just want to say thank you for... Uh, uh, thinking of me and thank you for what we're going to try to do whether it happens or not I just thank you right right and she looked at me and she goes I want you to worry about being funny and I want you to let me worry about everything else and I got in the car and I was like wow man it's like nobody ever said anything like that to right. me so in the midst of the next year the president of Warner Brothers came to see me and he was in you know he's like I'm in and then we were going to take the show. And then the president of ABC came to see me and sat next to the president of Warner Brothers at the Ice House. And I did 25 minutes. And I told the dude, give me the light at 20. And I was killing him, man. Killing him. And he gives me the light. And almost like a boxer that knows that if he gets to the end of the fight, that he's won. Mm -hmm. So I was digging in a little bit. Then I was kind of cruising at the end. And I knew what I had at the end. And when the light flicked on and off like that, it's like time. Right. And I, and I left, and the people were going crazy, man. And well, I, before I left the stage, before that guy got to me in my head, I thought, you just got yourself a television show. But I didn't know. Right. And then the next day, I flew to Houston, and I got picked up by this dude in a town car, and, and Bruce called me, and he goes, uh, he did Drew Carey, you know, he, he was a, uh, my partner. And he said, are you sitting down? I'm like, I'm in the, I mean, just got in Houston. He goes, ABC called and, you know, they want to do the show. Congratulations. And I was like, wow. Man. <laughs> I was like, so we hung up and I told the driver, hey, man, I just got a show on ABC. Dude didn't, <laughs> he didn't turn around. He, he didn't say budge, congratulations. Huh? <laughs> he, didn't say, he just kept driving. Just kept driving. <laughs> didn't go, hey, good for you. Just kept, <laughs> just driving. So that's how it, uh, it came about. And then, you know, uh, uh, it was so that show was so real. Like in the early eighties, I had a I had a, I got a DUI and I got put in a Foothill Jail and I got taken to Van Nuys and got arraigned. Mm -hmm. So when they take you on that sheriff's bus, <laughs> I don't know if the sheriffs knew to pass by every place that was important to me in my life, but they passed by houses I used to go party at, houses that friends had, restaurants where I used to go, and I'm sitting there, I'm chained to some other dude, and I'm like, is, are these guys fucking with, are they, are they 
Did my, is my grandmother driving this bus? <laughs> they're going by my schools. They're going by oh, my high school. I'm like, what the hell? Like, I'm on like a Starline tour. I'm like, man, this is getting depressing, man. Farewell, farewell to her. This, I said, going this is, by all the shit I used to do. Oh, I said, this is, <laughs> this is depressing. So they throw you in the tank up there. They're, they're, they're getting ready to call you. And the door opens and they bring in some guys with like the orange jumpsuits from county jail. <laughs> so I'm sitting down and I'm looking down. And then somebody sits next to me and he's wearing those jail sandals, you know. And I look down and the guy's toes are pa- are, are painted red. And I'm like, this dude's got <laughs> painted red toes. And I look up and he's got blonde hair. He's a Latino guy, big guy, and he's got blonde hair like a, like a you know, cross-dresser. Uh-huh. And I look down and I'm like, oh, man. And the sheriff comes to the door and he goes, Lopez. And I stood up. And I guess the dude's name was Lopez. And <laughs> he stood, he up, stood to up and the sheriff goes, no, Mrs. Lopez. <laughs> and uh, I sat down and the dude left. And I put that in the show, oh, word, wow. word for word. <laughs> like I tried to keep it as real as I could. I used real names of my teachers. Right. But I don't think it gets any more real than that. We, we did no, that in Miss Lopez. Miss huh? Lopez. Oh, man. Hilarious. So the show was a hit. I mean, the George Lopez show, you know, the 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 yeah. Tonight Show syndication was, was good. Yeah, yeah. Was, syndication's was still there, almost twenty years. Yeah, and then um, I was still married. I decided to take a year off, and then <clears throat> it was just tough to be home. You know, I hadn't been home mm-hmm. in a, in ten years. You yeah. know, so yeah. uh, I got offered a uh, a chance to, you know, do a talk show. So I did that for a couple of years, and in that I got divorced. But uh, you know. Uh, I made friends with my wife. I saw her yesterday and the ex-wife. And she's she goes, I just want us to be friends. I go, that's new. <laughs> and uh, But she's cool, man. That's and I good. didn't talk that's to her good. for a long time. But it was yeah. my fault that everything happened the way right. it happened. Right. But somehow, you know, instead of being mad at myself, I became kind of mad at her. But, yeah. you know, it, it that's all gone. Yeah, that's something that, that, that's something that George and I have in common. So we did... Talk a little bit about you know, that. on that golf course about us going through divorces mm. and things of that nature and how we've kind of moved on. Mm-hmm. But I also want to ask you about the producing part that you've gotten into. Yeah. You know, you, you've done the stand-up. And I, I also want to know, are you going to go back and do one more stand-up gig or anything like that? I, I don't I know, mean, man. I, you I know, think that would be so cool. You know, with dementia running in the family, it's harder <laughs> to remember that stuff. You know, I, I did the, the the Netflix special was the one the first one I had done not mm-hmm. live. Mm-hmm. And I didn't like the way... I like to do them live, but yeah, they're risky yeah. to do them live. But I thought, you know, how how can you make comedy harder is to not use water, not have a towel, and to do it live. But the older I get, you know, 60, the older I get, it, I think it, it gets harder to remember yeah. the hour. And sometimes in a default, if you forget your place, you'll go back to stuff that you already had done. And live, you want to keep it... You know, legit. So, but but I, I feel you there. Yeah, but produ- but producing was was new to me, and then, you know, I just felt like you know some guys want big parts. I just felt like, and I told my agents like, hey man, don't don't look at parts like big parts. Just look at parts as like good parts. Right. And then I started to do animation. Uh, and I remember the the Beverly Hills Chihuahua, the first one, the first time I did any mm-hmm. voice work. <laughs> You know, the, the, my agent said, all the good parts are taken, but if you want this part, it's four lines, $10,000. I said, four lines? So I said, ah, I'm not sure. So she calls, she calls, she goes, I want to know if you're doing it. You're doing it. If not, they're going to move on. And I said, you know what? I'll do it. And I remember getting there five minutes late, and I meet this director, Raja Gosnell, and I look over, and Drew Barrymore is in there. Mm. And I'm like, what the fuck is Drew Barrymore doing in there? And I said, oh, she's the girl dog. So I'm like, are you ready to start? I'm like, uh, yeah. <laughs> and the first thing I did is I sang to Drew Barrymore in the movie, The Dog's in Love with the, uh, the, the Chloe, which is Drew Barrymore. And I had to sing to her. And the guy's like, there's not a song, so just, you know, make it up. And <laughs> make Just make it up on the fly. I made it like my, you know, my heart, you're my heart, my soul. And I'm like, if there's if there's ever a time you need anybody to lick inside your ears, or to you know, I would be I would be most honored, you know. See, I'm forgetting you were a dog. That's a dog. <laughs> and she, after they go cut, and she goes, 
she put both hands on it. She goes, oh, my God, that's so sweet. Oh, my God. And that was the first time they'd ever heard that that voice in that dog. And then when I was done, the director came outside and he goes, listen, man, we haven't shot like most of the movie yet. So would you be willing to come in and just you and I work on stuff? And as we film the dog, I'll make the stuff fit to the dog. And I said, absolutely. And because I didn't say no, it was only four lines where I would have said no. That led to the three Beverly Chihuahuas, the two Smurfs, the two Rios, wow. Marmaduke, wow. and Escape from Planet Earth. All all of the movies came from that one seed. So, you know, as people want to be stars or want to be producers or want to be in the light, never say no, man, because a seed that small can bring you a tree, mm-hmm. you know, with the proper care. No, that, that's that's good. That's good advice yeah. because, like you said, you're turning down those small roles, thinking it's something better and bigger is going. Everybody would have said no. Everybody mm-hmm. would have said no to that. And uh, I and I went. That was cool. That was cool, George. I want to go back and we talked about this a little bit off the camera during our break, and I was telling you about the movie that you were in with Ty Diggs, and I couldn't remember the name. And it was River the Runs River, Red. River Runs Red, <clears throat> where you had. Uh, a much more serious part, yeah. you know, because everybody knows you as a comedian. Everybody right. knows, you know, your stand up and the Lopez show, the Tonight Show. They all know that. But I don't know how many people, and I'm sure it was a lot, but I, I know for me, when I first saw that and saw you in that role, yeah. I was like, damn, because you were, you were really good. Yeah, thank you. And, no. and, how, and how was that for you? Because, again, you're going from being a comedian to a very serious role. How was that for you? Um, <clears throat> You know, I... I I did Balls of Fury like in 2007 with the like, Reno 911 guys, and I was pretty pretty much like the straight guy, but just very calm, you know. And I mm-hmm. thought, you know, in some dudes like Jim, you know, those guys that are bigger actors, like they they're big. I wasn't a broad actor, you know. I was a, good at being just, you know, more deadpan. So when Wes Miller, that director, African American director, said, "I got something for you," and I said, "I'd already done a couple parts that were dramatic." And Tay was in that thing, and I was like, you know, I'll, I'll I'll do it. Yeah, that's cool. And, you know, I had lost a friend uh, to uh, to a police officer shooting. So if you look as an actor, like, what do you... I remember Ben Kingsley told me on my talk show that every experience that he's had, and he was neglected as a child, like, he went into a bottle, you know. Mm. Put all my bad experiences in the bottle. Mm. And whenever I need him, I open the bottle, and I take one out. And then I put the cap back on and I save it for the next time. Like all, so he used all the experiences as uh, in his life to make him to make him the actor that he is. Like the dramatic part, he would mm-hmm. remember things. And and I did that. You know, I cried on cue. You know, by losing a child and Ted lost a child, and um, I had Im- immediate chemistry with him. You know, and you know my show had already been out forever. I mean, you know, so we're in uh, Louisville, Kentucky. And we're shooting this scene in the car, and I'm driving, and the movie ca- the movie trailers in front of us, mm. and they're filming us. And he says, "So you, I want you guys to drive around, and you're looking for the police, like we're looking for the guy. We're ch- we're going like a western. We're going after these two police officers. So we're driving, and we're going under the bridge, and we're going around the town. And he goes, "Keep going, guys. You're all right. Look around, and we go we go under this." underpass and there's a homeless guy walking with a push cart and all his stuff and he's got a thing a a hoodie over his head that's hanging like hair and he's just pushing his cart and as we drive under the uh, the underpass he looks over and as we pass him he goes George Lopez (laughs) and the 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 the, (laughs) when, when we stop everybody gets out and they come over to the car and they go did that guy yell George Lopez and I go, he did. The homeless guy yelled your name. How did he know? How did he know it was you? I, got, I don't know. Maybe I got a TV in the car. I don't know. <laughs> but I, I mean, of it, of all, and it's never just George. It's always George, George Lopez, Lopez. Yeah. And uh, it's been it's been pretty wild, man. But that you know, in doing those dramatic parts, I did a thing, uh, No Man's Land, dramatic, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and then uh, River Runs Red, and then I did uh, this one. Oh my God! So. You know, <clears throat> whether people believe in uh, the universe or they believe in karma or if they believe in kindness, 
that's that's up to people, you know, that's up to the right. individual to right. decide. Absolutely. So I did this thing, man, uh, like the world's greatest dog, like most amazing dog mm-hmm. for Facebook. And uh, I was leaving and everybody was like, why are you doing this thing, man? I was like, you know, I don't know. I, it was Lisa Vanderpump. I wanted to hang out with Lisa Vanderpump. She's great. So when I'm leaving, this girl is there and she's dressed kind of like a guy and she's got a hat on and she's got her brother with her. And I get in the SUV and the window rolls up and I look and they're both standing there but kind of like really kind of meek, you know? And I roll the window down and I'm like, hey, what's going on? And they're like, George Lopez? And I said, yeah. He goes, oh. so I, I go, hang on. I get out of the car and I talk to her, what are you guys doing? And she goes, oh, you know, I'm like a little filmmaker. I'm trying to make this film about my life, about coming out to my dad on my prom night. And, you know, uh, 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 I wrote it already. And it's funny, man, because my brother and I were just talking about you. Like you would be the, the best person to play my dad. And then here you are. And I said, uh, well, listen, um, I'll give you my number, I'll give you my email, and if you get to the point where you make this thing, I said, uh, uh, let me know. I'll be your father. I'll, I'll mm-hmm. play your father. Mm-hmm. So about a year later, she calls to have the money, and schedule-wise, they're trying to work out. So I went to this place in like Chasworth, this house, and I was her. I played her dad in this in this little this little movie. That got on HBO Max and it got in the the LA Film Festival. Wow! So, um, you know, like three weeks ago, I got a call from my agent and he said, "Hey, man, I've been working on this thing for a couple of years and it's, st- it's starting to come together. So tomorrow at one thirty, I have a, a call set up for you and the director of this project." And he goes, "There's no script and it's very private and nobody knows anything about it, but he wants to talk to you." So I said, all right. So the next day at 1.30, I call this dude, Latino guy, Angel Miguel Soto, I believe. And he's like, hey, brother, what's happening? I said, oh, good, man. What's going on? So we talk about our lives, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. talk about growing up. And he says to me, yeah, man, you know, I saw you in this little movie like you were a dad. And I thought, River <laughs> Runs Red, you know. Uh-huh. And he goes, no, 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 about the girl that, came out on her prom night. Oh, yeah, at last. I said, yeah. He goes, I saw you in that. He goes, I, w- I had a project, an animated project at the LA Film Festival, but I was going to see other shorts, and I saw you, and I saw you, and I- he goes, I-, I cried. Like, I was like, oh, my God. So the next day they made they made me an offer. Uh, so <clears throat> DC, uh, you know, Marvel, DC uh, is coming out with the first Latino superhero. Uh oh. Uh oh. So it's the producer, writer, and director, all Latinos. And uh, that guy's the director of it. So he says, you know, there's no script. It's called The Blue Beetle. The kid from Cobra Kai is playing The Blue Beetle. Uh, so, you know, it's all very private. It was going to be on HBO Max only. And then Warner Brothers saw the script. They saw the people involved. So it has a release date of August 2023. So I got cast to be the uncle in the Blue Beetle. (laughs) So I'm going to be the uncle in the Blue Beetle uh, series, which nobody knows about yet. Oh, wow. And that's going to be on Netflix or is that going to be? No, it's going to be released. It'll be a worldwide release. Oh, wow. Because it's DC. So when they sent the offer, there's an offer for one movie and then under it, there's 10 more offers for other. Wow. So you said the kid from Cobra Kai. Is going to be the blue, uh, gonna gonna be be the the blue, blue, the blue beetle. Yeah. Wow. And I'm That's the so uncle, cool. And I'm the uncle in the blue beetle. That is so cool, George. Which is big, man. I mean, man, you know, so had quite cool. a career, but to get involved in the DC universe is big. Batman. Yeah. And I, oh, I think yeah. Batman is in our movie, but yeah. uh, it's a big, big deal. Man. Yeah. DC got everybody. And All nobody knows man. right now, but you guys. Well, there you go. See? See, that's what's happened when you're watching the, the Off the Dribble with Byron Scott. You get stuff like this from George Lopez. You get the you get the, the first of everything. You get it way before you even hit the presses. See, that's what it's all about. George, I, I mean, we talked about your producing. We talked about you as a comedian, drama, you know, just unbelievable actor, what you have meant to the Latino community. Yeah. How, how important is Which that I don't to know you? If, I don't know if I, what I've meant to the Latino community. You know, uh, <clears throat> come on, man. Come on now. I mean, you, you know, I, all I, the things you've done, come on now. Well, I know what they've meant to me. And uh, 
I think, you know, I think what they've meant to me is it, it might be the, uh, it might be the first family I ever had mm. of all those people that come up to you and say, Hey man, we saw you in this, or my daughter loves you. Or if you look at YouTube, every time they play low rider, like a little kid is jumping up and down the bed. Like they know my face, <laughs> like this little kid was taking a walk and with his dad and the kids got to be four years old. And there's a van with my picture on it, and the little kid walks over, and his dad says, where are you going? And he goes over to the van, and he points at my picture, and he goes, George Lopez. And the dad is like, how in the, how does this four-year-old kid know who you are? That's right, yeah. And, you know, I was always mad at everything, and I was always just negative about myself and about my upbringing but through just that one time in that day where you're down i mean you can you you can only go down Mm -hmm. worse but i decided to not worry about everybody else and worry about myself and that was the day that i think everything you know if you go one day without wishing anybody ill then makes the next day easier Mm -hmm. so when i turned that page and went to being not the most positive person but not wishing anybody any any harm Mm -hmm. or any bad things to happen to him and you know i i had grown up around buddhist temples you know my whole life and then i met the dalai lama like in 12 2012 or 10 and then i spoke at his 80th birthday party so those guys and that thing really helped me just you know since i cussed in church i don't think about welcome back (laughs) so i i think that you know just the principles of of being kind uh, uh, really made kind of the universe spin spin my way. Yeah, yeah. I had another question for you though, and, and you, we're, we're the same age, so you grew up in the in the hood like I did, and at our time, Man. you know, you know there, there was a whole lot of gangs, Ooh. Crips and Bloods, the Essays, Sunshine Crips, the Pyrus, the you know. How did you avoid? I know how I did. You know, I, obviously you did as well with, with laughter and things of but that nature. But did they leave you alone you, because you you could ball? Yes. Yeah. I mean that. I mean the reason the reason the Crips and Blood would would leave me alone when I was in high school, I would be coming home and they would stop us. You know, because we had we we always traveled like six or seven of us anyway because we wanted to make sure we protected ourselves. Right. But when they would jump out the car and surround you, man, you know it's twelve, it's six of us, twelve, thirteen of them, and then they would some you know be one person be like. Oh, that's that kid from Morningside High. Man. You know, that plays ball. No, they good. They good. And they would leave us alone. Yeah. So in your situation, I, I know you had to avoid the gangs as well. How, how did you do that? You know, man, you know, my grandfather never really, I don't think he hit me. I think he's more mental. You know, he made me more afraid of him than of being in gangs. But the guys that I grew up with started in high school they started to go a little sideways man they would mm-hmm. leave school mm-hmm. and go do home invasions like they'd break into mm. houses and they would come back to school and they would have you know chains or money or necklaces all and stuff. the shit they stole and, basically and all the shit they stole mm-hmm. and they would be like you want some of this shit I'm like no 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 i'm good man you know i'm good and then those guys ended up getting caught and then other guys would beat up i remember one time man there was a kid and his dad playing in the park and those guys were throwing a football around and then they were going to have a meeting and they asked me to leave because I wasn't with those guys and those Mm -hmm. guys I grew up with and they ended up beating up that guy in front of his kid Mm -hmm. and um, that's when I was like these dudes man that's just that's just bad, you yeah. know. And yeah. I didn't have a father, yeah. so I, you know it meant a lot. And none of those guys, I was just like, all right, I'm gonna gradually cut these cats out, you know. And just I played baseball, mm-hmm. but they were always around. They always try to get you to go leave school. No, I'm good, man. You know, yeah. I gotta, yeah. I gotta do my thing, man. I got, you know. However, but I decided, you know, it wasn't my grandfather's, you know, upbringing that I just decided for myself that I didn't want to go that way. Mm-hmm. You know, I could have, yeah, of course, but I, yeah. I wasn't, I wasn't that type of guy and I already was into comedy and all that stuff so uh I decided to let them to let them have that and mm-hmm. you know uh and uh and go on to do my thing but the thing when I got back home and my grandfather was there he would belittle me for like 
leaving and coming back early. What happened? Those guys kicked you out. They kicked. They didn't want you around. Huh? Is mm, that what happened? Mm. But uh, when I was 14, we had this dance, and a lot of the girls from school were going. And then I was dressed in the best clothes that I that I had. <laughs> right. And then this guy said to me in front of everybody, "I thought we were supposed to dress up." And mad broke my mm. heart, man. Mm. And I went home and I I got in my room and I said, if I grow up and if I make anything of myself. Nobody's gonna ever make fun of me for the things that I'm wearing, and yeah, uh, yeah I've done it. Yeah, no, you, so. you've done it and, and some. Yeah. Uh, so, so George, what are some of the things that you're working on or doing right now that we got to be looking out for? Yeah, you know, right now uh, we're getting ready to shoot a pilot with my real daughter Mayan. Oh wow, that's uh, cool for NBC and Bruce Alford, my original creator. They're excited about this thing called Lopez versus Lopez, like court papers. Oh yeah. <laughs> and uh, uh, is that how you came up with the name, man? <laughs> Lopez versus Lopez. The divorce. Oh, <laughs> great! You mean where I lost half my money? <laughs> yeah, sure. I think that's funny. Yeah, let's go back to that. Right? My wife gave me a kidney, and I left her. <laughs> yeah, why not? But that, but that's one. And then you know, I have restaurants and mm-hmm. beer and tequila mm-hmm. coming out. And uh, what's the tequila? Uh, what's the name of the tequila? Chicano. Chicano with the X. Yes. Hand I'll be, bottled. I'll be looking for that. Hand bottled in Mexico. And the bottle is unique. It's so unique, it doesn't fit on the machines in Mexico. And you know, Mexico, <laughs> everything fits on a machine in Mexico. Uh, they're like, they're, they have to hand pour them, the, the ladies, because it doesn't fit. That's beautiful, nice. You know, I've been working on it for probably about four years. And then um, I have a children's book oh, wow. called uh, Chupacabra Carter. And it's about a kid growing up and looking in the moon and trying to decide where his future is going to be. And then he befriends a kid that looks like the Chupacabra and they grow, kind of grow up. And he's looking for his family and uh, that's getting ready to come out too. And, that, and it's that's a that's a good book. We're all written. I think I think the kids will like it. I think it'll be a hit. Good, good. I got two granddaughters. Or I got four granddaughters. They'll love it, man. Very so drawn gotta, very well. Yeah, I it and read it to them. And the restaurants are doing extremely well. Restaurant I know that. Good. Yep. Opening you have the more. one in uh, Manhattan Beach? or got the uh, one in Hermosa. Yep. And then I think there's they're going to open one in the Stratosphere in Vegas. And then there's one going up in some casinos around the country. So, you know, everything's good, man. Man. Listen, guys, I want to thank my boy George Lopez thank for you. coming by today. Look out for the the, the movie later on because, again, like he just said, you know, we the only one know about that right now. This is something that hasn't been uh, talked about yet, but when it comes out, check it out. George Lopez, my boy, my golf my, my golf buddy, my yeah. drinking buddy. My man. Ooh, my man, my man. I, I, I want to thank you again, G. B, I love you, Thank you, brother. brother. Love right you, on, too. Man. Guys. This is another episode of Off the Dribble with your boy Byron Scott. Wait for the next one. Check us out. And you can always go on and uh, subscribe. We're on YouTube. And anything you can find that, that does podcasts, we are on it. So check us out. And we are out with my boy Joe Lopez. Until the next time, guys. Peace.